AIDS is ever reported in, uh, since the outbreak started. We're 27, I think, 28, something around that. Um, you know, we will see if that's just a, a blip in the curve or if it's going to be something, hopefully not, that's going to be sustained at that level. But I'm sure that you hear and you read and you watch the same news as I do and you know what's going on in other states and also what's going on in the rest of our state. Uh, many counties really struggling with uh, a pretty sharp, in some cases, increase in number of cases. Uh, that's happening both in some urban counties but also in some rural counties at this point, uh, including some counties around Shawnee County. So we're definitely watching uh, very carefully what's happening in uh, surrounding counties to make sure that our interventions are coordinated and are appropriate. Number of tests performed remain more or less the same. Uh, the number of positive tests, the percentage of positive tests went up a little bit, but not substantially. What went up, again, for the third week in a row is the proportion of cases for which we do not have an identified source. And as we talked last time, that's a reason for concern because those are what we consider the community acquired cases, people for whom we really didn't know where they got it. And uh, um, the other thing that went up, or not went up, but yeah, I guess went up, is the proportion of cases among young individuals. And I think the two things may not be unrelated. The, the, the fact that we don't know where people got it and where more young people are getting it. Number one, in many cases, young people are uh, uh, either have few symptoms or sometimes have no symptoms. So, so really, they, they really can't tell you when, when this whole thing started and it's harder than to pinpoint the source of infection. Uh, second, we suspect, although we have no data to support that, but based also on what we are seeing in other states, the source of infection for some of these young people is just the fact that they, they congregate with each other and they congregate in public establishments and especially bars. And uh, uh, um, we know that in some cases in other states, especially in Texas, that has been proven to be a source of infection. We don't know about our community. But it's definitely one of the things we're going to watch for is, is wh where do they get it? But, but the fact remains that there is more virus, I think, circulating in our community so that there are more opportunities than before for people to be infected. And then even if the young ones, of course, they don't develop severe symptoms, they bring it back home with grandpa, grandma, uncle, aunts, and, 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 and those are the people who then may become severely sick. Um, so that's really just very quick overview of what happened last week. I don't know if you have any burning questions. Otherwise, I would suggest that we postpone a more in-depth discussion about those numbers at the next meeting. I, I just had a question. I, I've heard that there's a, a of course, that there's an uptick going on all over the, the country. But they said hospitalizations were going down and, and deaths were going down. What, I don't, is the virus weakening or is it, or is it just, just we're better at taking care of it? Um, the virus is not weakening. There is really no evidence. The, the virus is the same. It's been remarkably stable from the genetic point of view because those viruses of, often mutate, just like the influenza virus, that, which is not a coronavirus, but you know many viruses often mutate. This one so far hasn't really mutated to, to any extent that would change the, the uh, virulence, the aggressivity of the virus. Uh, definitely healthcare has improved because now we know how to treat these patients then better than before. Uh, but the other thing to keep in mind is that there is a delay effect from the time you see an increase in number of cases to the time you see an increase in hospitalization, especially when the increase in number of cases affects primarily young individuals. Because again, those individuals are less likely to be hospitalized, but they will then transmit the virus to other people who may be in older age groups, people in their families or, or extended families, and those are the people that may end up in the hospital. So first of all, anyone who acquires the virus, many times they are not hospitalized until about a week or two into the, the disease. That, that, that's not a general rule, of course. There are many variations. And second, when you have a lot of young people who are infected, you can expect that there would be a secondary wave of cases as a result of those people, and those may be the cases that end up in the hospital. I heard anecdotally, I have no evidence, maybe Dr. Norman, who is here, may speak to that, that Sedgwick County has actually seen an increase in uh, hospitalizations there. Um, we haven't seen that here in Topeka yet, but we know that we, our hospitals are ready and we are watching those numbers. 
questions. No. Thank you. Okay. Um, Dr. Norman. Uh, Dr. Lee Norman is a State Health Officer from the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Uh, I'm sure he needs probably no introductions, and he can certainly introduce himself better than I can do. He's been an incredibly good colleague uh, during the, the, this uh, pandemic. He and I have consulted multiple times, and uh, he has helped us multiple times making some of the tough decisions. And I'm really thrilled and honored that he accepted to be part of our Board of Health meeting today. And uh, just uh, uh, for the record, I have to apologize ahead of time. I will have to sneak out of this meeting at 11.30 for another commitment. Thank you, Dr. Pizzino. Good morning. My name is Lee Norman. I'm the, uh, the, the secretary of the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, where I've been for the last 18 months. Prior to that, I was the chief medical officer at the University of Kansas Health System. And uh, when I was, uh, I was in that role until July of 2017, which is I uh, resigned that position after about a decade and deployed with the Army to the Middle East as a medical commander, 35th Infantry, which had all 12 countries and three named operations. I bring that up as a backdrop because uh, I, I saw firsthand when in that year or so that I was in the Middle East, um, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome dash CoV, which was a coronavirus. Very highly lethal. Uh, and this is a different one that we are existing with now, which is, uh, I don't think time will tell whether that's the good news or the bad news. It's a different one than, than that one. But I bring it up in the context that that virus and the infections from the MERS CoV in the Middle East didn't peak out until its fourth year. So one of the questions I get a lot is, yeah, you're knitting your brow. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> the, um, one of the things we get asked a lot is, are we in wave one? When's wave two going to hit? Are we still in wave one? And the answer to that is there, we can look at the last 400 years of pandemics and we can extrapolate and bring forward what we think are the best, uh, best information we have. But in reality, we don't know if it's going to be a, a second larger peak uh, or if it'll be multiple peaks over multiple years. Only time will tell that. And that's why, as Dr. Pizzino and, and as Linda and your health department here are doing, is trying to build resiliency into the, their systems. And by the way, there's about maybe five or six health officers that I really work with very closely. It wouldn't surprise you that for the most part they're in the larger areas. But Dr. Pizzino and I have worked uh, for at least a, a dozen years together, and uh, we share a lot of great information with he, Linda, and the staff. So we have, I think, a very good, high-quality relationship. The, and by resiliency means we had to, as you know, start off with this pandemic way understaffed. We didn't have testing equipment. We didn't have PPE and the like, so it has been a struggle. There's no question about it. Federal partners, not, not particularly helpful. But we are eventually catching up now and are trying to get a 90-day stockpile, for example, of PPE so that we can make sure that we can help the counties out. Uh, we've already dispensed around $63 million worth of PPE to every, it's, some has gone to every county, every health department. Uh, we still are dispensing PPE uh, every day someplace in the state. We additionally have procured remdesivir, which is the experimental antiviral that is approved under emergency use authorization by the FDA. And every place that there's been a COVID-19 positive patient in a hospital bed who qualifies, every, uh, every one of those hospitals has remdesivir. So, and it, I don't know if it's going to be the uh, successful or not, quite honestly. It's approved, um, and early indicators are that it's helpful for critically ill people. But the, the, the blocking and tackling that goes on is exactly what you're seeing with your health department and, hope, and I think around the state and all 105 counties. And that is um, early case identification, testing around the, those cases, and the contacts. So it's, it's the same basic public health processes for, you can track it all the way back to the 1500s really when with the bubonic plague was where some of these basic detective maneuvers took place. Identifying illness, screening for illness, testing, contact tracing, 
and isolation and quarantine. That is the blocking and tackling until we get the magic bullet of either a antiviral or, uh, and or, of course, a vaccine, then the best we're doing is pushing down the numbers, pushing them into the future, until which time we have a way to um, prevent them from getting ill by way of a vaccine. I'm not an enthusiast for herd immunity, meaning allowing for people to get ill. Uh, the reason I'm not an enthusiast for that, it does work, but you could, would have to sacrifice four, six million people in the United States before we would get to that. Because we are at a less than 5%, significantly less than 5% in Kansas, probably less than 1% of people have been infect, infected at this point. It's on the uptick, as uh, Dr. Pizzino mentioned, in the state of Kansas, we had 504 new cases just in Kansas just since Monday two additional deaths to the question I think that came up is, yeah, the death rate is dropping um, in certain areas. This is the first week, though, that we, in all three indicators, the rate of new case development is going up. Statewide, the rate of new of hospitalizations is slightly up, and the number of deaths, the rate of death is slightly up. Very discouraging, and I think it's exactly what Dr. Pizzino mentioned, which is as people are out and congregating more, then we're starting to see more spread. And finally, it is true that uh, the congregate settings have been where most of the problems have been. We just, and I saw, and I know you know this, the, with uh, the Kansas Neurologic Institute here with a cluster of cases. It's important to remember that those viruses don't start in those congregate settings. They're brought in from the community. So even though that might be congregate settings, th those viruses come in from the set, uh, community, and that's why I think the judgment calls that you make are so critical and not easy, quite honestly. One size does not fit all for the state of Kansas. If I ever get any gray hair in this process, it'll be uh, of trying to make everything fit into the same shoe size, and it doesn't work that way. So I applaud you uh, and your health department for trying to a custom approach that, and you have less than perfect information. I uh, ha have plotted out how many cases and all this stuff and then what are the decisions that we've made all along the way, and then what within a week or two weeks after that, realizing that cause and effect is sometimes kind of hard to necessarily nail down completely because there are forces outside of our own control. When I look, Missouri cases are going up, Oklahoma cases are going up dramatically, and uh, we, no state is an island and no county is an island, so we have to judge it within the environment that we're in as well. And, um, and then adjust accordingly. So I hope we don't have any major uh, backsliding or back, uh, having to step backwards in terms of uh, controls or um, gather numbers of people gathering and that kind of thing. But I think we do have to be resilient and willing to make adjustments. And mm -hmm. I recognize that everything has its consequence. Like you, very concerned about the economy, way of life, people's mental health, and the desire to get back at uh, a more normal life. But again, hopefully that my comment about the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome pe peaking in the fourth year, hopefully it won't be anything like that. And by the way, they don't have a vaccine for it. So with that, I'll, with that cheery news, uh, I will say uh, that I, again, thank you for your leadership and, and I think you can be grateful also to the, and I know there's, there's always second guessing of decisions that are made and, uh, and courses that are chosen, but, uh, I think you'd, uh, you know, you'd make the best decisions you can with the information you have. And I'll tell you from, uh, I don't speak for Governor Kelly, except to say that we are here to support you. We're here to support your health department and the community. We live in the same community you do. So any comments? Any questions? Sure you do. I, I've always got questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, uh, I was wondering, a, a couple weeks ago, the, the, the ratio of transmission was 1 to 0.8. Yeah. Has that changed any? It's about a little bit above 1.0. You learned more science than you ever thought you wanted to, haven't you? I so? had no idea. That I would <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it has gone a little bit above 1. In theory, that if you get to an R0, the infectivity factor below 1, then, and the farther below the 1, the better, then it'll, it'll eventually fizzle out, much like the SARS in 2003, 2004, it came on like gangbusters, and and then the R naught dropped to well below one, and it fizzled out. This one is hovering right around 0.8 to 1.4. Remember, it started at a significantly num higher number, more in the 3.8 range, which means that for every one person that gets it, 3.8, it will never fizzle out when it's above one. 
he could maybe beat it into submission. And that's what we're doing. And that's been very effective with the measures taken up to this point. Okay. Yes, Dr. Norman, can we talk about, there's some recent reports about um, the sunlight and maybe affecting the uh, transmission and seeing a lower transmission if people are out and being active. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, because this is a prime time right now where it hasn't gotten exceptionally hot right. to be out and be active. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. The question being, uh, is it sunlight? Is it the seasonality uh, of the summertime uh, when people are outside and not in close uh, proximity, coughing and sneezing and whatnot, or additionally, is it the vitamin D goes up in the summertime, the vitamin D in a person's body? And it does appear to be mostly related to distancing. People tend to be a little farther apart, uh, and school is, to, is not in session. And by the way, for as controversial as closing schools is, it had a profound effect on this spread throughout the state of Kansas and in every state. You can, you can look at 54 states and territories and map it, the, the activity against school closures, and it's one of the uh, uh, most prominent predictors of decreasing case volume. So distancing is more likely in the summertime. And curiously, uh, if people, if you're in the sun, it converts vitamin D to an active vitamin D, you're less likely to catch the disease, and especially people with normal vitamin D levels in their body are less likely to die of it. So it is a good thing. A week from now, we're going to be looking at the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. Typically, that's a time to gather together, large groups, uh, community, neighborhoods, uh, different uh, parades. Any thoughts on what we should be doing a week out as the state health officer looking at that? Yeah. Uh, well, case 4th of July. Cases will go up. We saw that happen Memorial Day. We saw it happen Mother's Day. We saw it happen on uh, with Party Cove lashing of boats together. So when people gather, there will be more. And we might as well ask about the state fair and county fairs as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the, case, the number of cases will go up with that. The question is, what appetite do you have for putting in restrictions? Finney County, for example, with their county fair, they've decided to not have the county fair, except they are going to have the livestock uh, competition and auctions for the youth livestock program. So that would be a modification that I think is sensible. Shawnee County is going to a virtual fair this year where the contestants are bringing in their items, dropping them off, they're judged, and then they pick them up. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that Shawnee County is going to have a fair, but it's going to be different. Yeah, so. there's a lot of different going around. <laughs> uh, oh. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Norman, it seems like um, recently the, the information that I've seen is saying that this, this virus has spread respiratorily and not necessarily through surfaces. Um, and you know, we've, the county and, and many other businesses have gone to great lengths to put, you know, additional measures in place where I know even at our swimming pools, they're disinfecting the handrails on the ladders and things every hour on the hour. And, and it, I mean, are those still necessary, you think, or? You know, I think that they are, um, but they may not lead to quite as much protection as we originally thought. Um, but there's, there's no question that anything your hand touches eventually gets in your eyes or mouth. I remember back when my children were little, 38 and 40 years ago, one of them was a thumb sucker. And I used, they remember that stuffy paint on them that was real bitter. I discovered that no matter how careful I was, I got some on my hands. And before I knew it, my eyes were, it, were burning and I realized it, it hadn't been two minutes. Um, so I think that it's still a good idea. It may not be salvation, and certainly not as much so as the distancing and protection of the expulsion from the nose and mouth. Uh, I was going through the numbers the other day, and it said I came up with 0.3% of Shawnee County population has had the virus that, that confirmed. Yes. How many out there do you think really? Do we have any idea of how many actually have the vi or have had it? Well, we don't have complete knowledge of that. We can compare to where there's been broader population studies, like in Iceland and, some, and uh, in some communities like in San Francisco. I, I suspect it would be safe to say that it's, we haven't even measured half of the number of active cases out there. To that end, we at, in the state lab, we're developing and uh, are coming online this week with a blood test that will measure antibodies, because one of the, one of the things we want to do, sir, is to answer that question by drawing antibodies, the IgG and IgM, which will tell you if you had the 
illness recently or in, in the slightly more distant past. And that will tell us uh, what percentage of people had it. We will we'll test around six, we'll, we'll find around 6,000 randomly selected people in the state and that'll give us a good idea to predict. Do we know enough about this virus to know if you can catch it a second or third time? Or? We don't know that about this virus yet because at its core we really don't know how many serotypes or how many different strains there will be. Uh, where antibodies protect, that's what they do for a living. So when, if a person gets gets it, we can measure their antibodies, they should be protected from reinfection, but against that virus or that viral strain. There's, a, uh, there's another viral illness called dengue fever that has, what is it, John Franco, maybe I think four different serotypes. Um, and if you get uh, infected with one of them, you have a strong antibody reaction against that one, but you can still catch the other three. It's too soon to know on, on this one, and, but uh, antibody, because then the next question, which would be a really good one also, is okay, you got an antibody positive, so you've had it. Does that mean you won't get it again? Or, and that is, we don't know if it's, if it's not a quantitative antibody test. One of the things that we do know, and, and, uh, and it's kind of a drastic treatment in a sense because it's not widely available, is plasma transfusions. We've seen very dramatic results when somebody's critically ill, and then somebody that's had it does a, uh, a plasma phoresis to pull off those, the serum and the antibodies and gives it to that person that has it that we've seen some dramatic results from that. Matter of fact, my 38-year-old my son who lives in Brooklyn, New York, was sick with COVID-19. Unfortunately, he ended up doing well, sicker than heck for uh, 15 days, and, and he's signed up with the Blood Bank of New York to, for plasma phoresis. So uh, I think there's some hope for that. Uh, we'd much rather get antibodies in people from a vaccine, of course. What would you say is the recovery rate from somebody contracting this virus? The vast number re recover. The, uh, in the state of Kansas, I, didn't, I don't have the numbers on the top of my head from today, but let's say we have 13,000, we have close to that, and let's say 300 uh, deaths. So, and if, if those 13,000 represent half the number of cases out there, the, the mortality rate's pretty low. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes. If I'm hearing you, and again, we hear things on a national scale, and uh, um, there's a lot of people that are talking, and you hear a lot of talk. Mm -hmm. But if I hear you today, one of the things you're saying is the principle may not be as much as the um, disinfectants and the wipes as much as it is social distancing and the masks. I, th I think in an order of magnitude, that's true. And so from a county's perspective, should we be placing more emphasis on encouraging mask wearing because this has become a very politically divisive issue oh. and that you have a vast majority of the population who find it offensive to be wearing a mask yes. and you have half the population that find it offensive that you don't wear a mask. Right. And so we have this divide in our community. How can we as the Board of Health encourage people to do what you're recommending, which is wear masks, since it has become a divisive issue? Yeah, it is, and it, it absolutely has. Even in my own agency, I'll get in the, on an elevator and I'll have a mask on, and one of my and we have mas and we have I, we have um, sheets of paper stuck up that is reminders uh, about wearing masks, and I'll have one of my own employees get on and uh, and do how much do I want to intervene and and serve as the policeman, the watchdog? You know, that's not the kind of relationship I want to foster. And you're right; it's become very political. I can absolutely assure you that masks work. Do they work at 100% uh, of the time if both of us uh, in an, engaged in a conversation, we both have it on? Is it a 0% likelihood that, you'll, that it will be transmitted if one, or, uh, one of us has it? No, it's not. Uh, it, but it's incrementally uh, beneficial. And that question has been asked and answered. Uh, it, it shouldn't be a debate whether masks work. Now, if it reduces your relative risk by 15 or 20%, is that sufficient to come in with a policy change to make that happen. Um, I, I think that one, I, I would like to see businesses require masks, for example, and uh, because that's something that they can control. I think it's uh, very difficult to enforce mask wearing in a community. But I'd like to see, I'd even like to see businesses compete on the ability to, to have, for example, the safest businesses possible. Now, do I think a draconian um, requirement for every event is a way to do, uh, to enforce mask wearing. I don't really think that that's probably the best way to go, but I would like to see everybody wear masks. 
I'm now, hedging just a little bit. You may have noticed. If we're sitting here, I have my mask. Uh, we all have our masks, yeah. but we none of us have them on. Mm -hmm. Is there? Is it a matter of the distance? As we get closer, we should be putting our masks. Yes. Yeah. And I've done with my X-ray eyes. You're all six point six feet two inches apart or greater, <laughs> and you have three uh, total air exchanges per minute uh, through your HVAC <laughs> system. So we're safe right now. Yeah, you Hi are. Hypothetically. <laughs> yeah. I. Uh, matter of fact, even in my own agency, we've. Uh, uh, Conference room number 530 is very large. Our incident command meets in there. We've got play, uh, stickers on the floor. So we come in and, and if we've been riding the elevator and that kind of thing in masks, take them off, sit there. We have not had a single person in my agency contract the illness. And we've been there every day since January. And uh, now people don't come ill. I cannot tell you how many people come to work ill. And uh, that's why I think that as much as I'm loath to say, ask these screening questions every time and do the uh, thermal uh, thermometer scan every time is I think is uh, it's kind of annoying in a sense but it has worked and has I even uh, know of a case and not in this town I can assure you of a neurosurgeon who tried to sneak in knowing he was ill and he was ill with COVID-19 a neurosurgeon that tried and reckoned he knew he had a fever but had a case he need, felt he needed to do and then eight people later, uh, including the patient he worked on, came down with COVID-19, uh, unconscionable. So I think we have to make it safe for, and have HR, human resources type uh, things in place so that uh, people are not um, to in incentivized to come to work ill. I know we've seen this in food packing plants uh, where, uh, and meat packing plants and other uh, places where people are penalized for illnesses. And that's, we have to drive that out and work with our companies to encourage um, a, a kinder and gentler way to encourage people to stay home when they're sick. I see a variety of masks out there. I'm sure some of them have a lot better yeah. record of stopping the virus than others. The Commissioner Cook's mask is cloth. Probably about like having a chain link fence keep mosquitoes out of your backyard, but it's <laughs> <laughs> probably slightly better than that. We can measure it. We can actually test it. To that point, sir, we uh, we we ordered three million masks from a particular vendor in Canada, which is code word for China, uh, where yeah. they were being manufactured, and uh, and uh, but I said before we because that's three million masks at about four dollars a mask with about thirteen cents worth of uh, material. Yeah. And I said, you know, I didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday. Um, so I got a prototype in from this ca Canadian s vendor, and there's a million of them out there. This thing wouldn't have made a good coffee filter. It was so bad. I, and uh, so we did not buy those, you know, again, $12 million worth of masks. I, I noticed in the governor's plan, they didn't make wearing a mask, or, and I think it was up to phase two, was, there was no requirement to wear a mask. Right. It was just a recommendation. Yeah. Well, and that, that is exactly right. The, and this is one of the hard things about managing this particular pandemic is that there's been flip-flop and changing of opinions. You know, early on the CDC said masks are more likely to cause problems than to provide benefit. And, and then they backpedal a little bit and say, well, we did that. We said that because we didn't want to deplete the N95s and keep them away from hospital staff and first responders and the like. And in reality, I think that undermines confidence. There's no question that masks work. I've said that earlier. Uh, but, it, and that, those, what you point out, were ironed, uh, were, were put into effect back earlier on when it was more about mask preservation than because we couldn't get them anywhere and prioritization. But now there's, I think we uh, could be more liberalized with the use of those masks. And it doesn't have to be the N95. One. And by the way, we do test masks. We have a, a device where we can, uh, if you want, mm -hmm. a freshly washed one. Uh, uh, we can measure it. The, the one that I mentioned from China, it had a, it's to, to be protective, it has to score, I'll, I'll just give the number, 100 or greater in terms of its, its, uh, how well it functions. And it was seven. Um, so it was a chain link fence. <laughs> Mosquitoes would have gotten in. Mm -hmm. In the governor's declaration, uh, it, disaster declaration, the, the number one thing listed on there was economic recovery. Mm -hmm. Do you guys, do you get involved in that aspect of it? And, and is, can we help economic recovery and, and how we 
maybe how we present the numbers and and uh, because yeah. y you know how statistics are. And yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's a. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, well, what a uh, good question. Um, I am not on the SPARC committee, that, which is looking into how to dole out the fe large federal amounts of money. Matter of fact, the State Finance Committee is meeting today uh, to have some of that further discussion. Mostly I'm relied upon to give public health information. Um, but I also, I'm not, I didn't, like I said, I, I have a, I don't know, 30 years ago, a Master's of Business Administration. I've run both at uh, a large health system in Seattle and at KU, been very attentive to economic trends and what it takes to be successful in a business, whether it's for profit or nonprofit. So we've always wanted to, whether it's uh, K through 12 higher education or opening businesses in the economy, keep things go moving, keep things going. Now, in retrospect, would there have been a things that we would have done different? Probably, because hindsight's always 2020. But um, it's always been a goal to keep things moving. Yes. You know, one of the concerns as we get closer to fall, and I'm sure by fall we'll know a lot more than we know now, as we know a lot more now than we did in February. Mm -hmm. um, it seems with young people, children especially, it's going to be difficult to have a mask on and getting schools and having schools go. Um, where does the state look at using maybe face shields or other alternate devices than a mask um, that since they provide some protection they may not provide as much as a mask might mm -hmm. but they do provide some protection and it may be easier to have young children wearing face shields as opposed to a mask yeah you're right yeah anything below age eight is like a fool's game almost to try to keep masks on kids um, and and besides that and you know how it is if your glasses are fogging up or they're tilting, you're messing with them, and then you have your own respiratory droplets that may have been filtered out by the mask, and then you itch your eyes or whatever. Masks are no fun. Nobody likes them. Um, um, face shields do add things. I'm not sure that they would be necessarily any better adopted by, for example, K through 5 or whatever. Uh, I think that, that is something that the, the board of the school, uh, the Department of Education, excuse me, is working on this ex right now. We have members from my agency that are on there providing public health guidance. They'll next week we'll meet with the superintendents to roll out the many aspects of K through 12, and then finally, of course, the recommendations will go to the local school boards who have the final say on what it'll look like. And I know that that one's is, is one of them in the hopper for discussion. Um, they, and they, we have a, a lot of face shields available. That's not. That's not been a supply chain problem as much as masks have and, and even gowns. Just in public wear, if I decide that I want to don a face shield as opposed to a mask, mm -hmm. um, am I do, am helping myself at all? Or Yeah, yeah, they, they are protective. I can't tell you uh, compared to which quality of mask and that kind of thing, but they are definitely protective. And, of course, we see that on a lot of uh, businesses uh, because it's easier to work with a, a face shield on or a face shield and a mask. In a lot of hospitals, they wear face shields and masks. Uh, uh, face shields are protective, not 100%. You know, none of the things we've talked about are 100% protective, but you cannot get mar the, the risk, to, you cannot mitigate the risk without uh, an antiviral medication and vaccine. You can't mitigate risk down to zero. But if, if you can get 15% benefit by a mask, 15% by a shield, uh, distancing another 15 percent you can get you can pick it up that's how it's pushed down the r sub naught from 8.3.86 uh, down to 1.1 you mentioned uh, when you're talking about kids going back to school uh, and i heard you say you weren't a, a big fan of herd immunity but isn't that essentially what we'll get if we send a bunch of kids to school uh, uh, they're as a, as a group, they're they're probably the least affected by this virus mm -hmm. so far. Actually, I'm very fond of herd immunity. Uh, oh, okay. I just how we get there ah. uh, by naturally occurring. See, the Sweden, the Swedish experiment was different than the rest of the Scandinavian countries. They said we're a very homogeneous population. We will, uh, we won't, we won't do the draconian things that are going to interfere with the uh, economy and whatnot. And it, things were going swimmingly until they didn't. And now they're seeing the downside of herd immunity, which is they have a lot of sick people. They've got more sick people in Sweden than all the rest of the Scandinavian countries combined. So, yes, the kids can get it. They won't be necessarily as 
uh, affected with illness, but as Dr. Pizzino mentioned in his opening comments, you do worry about where they transmit it to. Where they go from yeah. there. Yeah. I, but I, I, as far as just getting herd immunity, there, it looks like it's one of the better vehicles as far as they're going to spread it. Yeah, well, it, oh, no, it's kind of like, and some people are comparing it to the uh, chicken pox parties of the 60s <laughs> and 70s or 80s or whatever that started and stopped, I should say. And chicken pox parties probably worked. There were some casualties along the way. This is a much more severe illness than chicken pox. <laughs> um, I have a question about the antibodies. If somebody, let's say somebody has it, they get the antibodies, I mean, obviously, I think most people would assume that means they won't be able to contract it again, but can they still spread the virus? Presum um, presumably not. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Any other questions? Well, thank, thank you very you. much. I, I hope no other questions because I've given you everything I know. <laughs> for the, Do Dr. Norman, thank you very much. For the rest much. of them, please rely on your local people. But uh, we always stand ready to help, and we especially, of course, stand ready to help your county and your health department. Okay. Thank you, thank very, you much. very much. And thank thanks you. for attending today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Norman, and we do appreciate your support and your staff. We, we are not in this alone, and there's been times I felt that way, and I remember, oh, yeah, KDHE people are working the same kind of hours we are. They are. I have talked to them on the weekends. I know they are just also working very hard. So thank you so much for being here today and answering our questions. Um, through the whole uh, pandemic and the last few months, we've had a lot of questions about mental health, about suicide rates, about domestic violence. And so we've got some speakers here today to talk about what has happened in the last few months. We did put out a press release yesterday about this, and I will just say we call this a snapshot. We don't know really what the impact of the virus is yet, and I want to be very careful not to say, well, because of the virus, this is what happened, because we don't know that yet. But we can look at some of the trends that we've seen in these areas over the last few months. So I'm first going to ask uh, Chief Richard Siegel from the Topeka Fire Department to come up and talk. He is in charge of the emergency medical services with the Topeka Fire Department. Also, he's been a great partner with the uh, incident command structure. He's our safety officer. Another example of how the city and the county have really partnered to deal with this pandemic. And so, Chief, I'm going to let you talk for a few minutes about suicide rates. Thank you, Linda and Commissioners. A privilege and honor to be here, as always. Um, biggest thing I wanted to bring there, and, and just in my role, is that I contribute to the data. I, I consider myself a, a data nerd, data geek, and like to see those trends, patterns, and things along those lines. Well, in the role of safety officer, and even prior to that, I'd had a pretty good investment with the, with the health department as a whole trying to work. I've also worked on the community CI team with Sergeant Clam, the P Topeka Police Department. So I've been invested in the, the mental health side of this as well. And about three years ago, we made an investment in, in the city of Topeka there for our patient reporting system that allows us to get some very good in-depth data there. And so when the questions came up saying when we look at the snapshot as to what what does mental health look like there? So from my perspective, I see it at that EMS level. And, and what we saw is if you just compare apples to apples right now, right now this year, we see a lower in terms of our response. Um, I know uh, Mr. Barnes will be up here a little bit later and can speak to those. I don't have them memorized 100% off the top of my head there. But we do know it's a little bit lower. And, and so then we start asking when you look at data and you look at numbers, what questions should it trigger? Are we capturing something well? Are we not? Uh, what does it actually mean for our community? And so we'll continue to watch those numbers there. We'll con com continue to compare it and see if we see any trends there. I think some of my other mental health colleagues in the room there will probably agree this is going to be a long term. Shawnee County is unique into our mental health uh, struggles that the community faces as a whole. So it's, it's nothing new triggered one way or the other by the virus, but we definitely can see some trending. And I think it's helping us to look at how this is another issue that we need to be aware of along those parts there. Um, again, as Linda said as well there, I have the privilege and honor of serving as a safety officer for the, for the response team. Uh, been a great learning opportunity along with that one and then being able to contribute with the colleagues there. So I stand for any direct questions there and I'll be available here as we get into that. Yesterday we had an ambulance advisory board meeting and we were talking about the impact that the COVID has had on the ambulance industry. And if I understood that what they were indicating correctly, that we've seen a lot less ambulance runs or calls um, because of during this period of time, 
maybe not because of the virus, but it's happened during this time that we've been uh, this year. Um, how has it affected the fire department? Yeah, so great question in terms of, you know, how does it affect each, each agency there? Every fire department around the country, if you look at the stats there, saw the dip. We use March 16th is what I've been tracking because that's when we really turned on some dispatch controls and everything else, and we ramped up our response. And, and I looked at it just in terms of a moving average across the line, and you watch that hit when we went into the safer at home protocols and everything else, we saw the dip. And, and but it, within the last month that we've opened up, we've seen us come back out of the dip. So the call volume is returning back to that normal baseline. Uh, our normal baseline for us is right around 50, and, and we're just smack dab back to that again. Uh, we had a couple of days um, last week there, I think we hit 73 responses. So it's, it's coming back, so we're seeing that return. So it, it, it knocked our call volume down, and that's what a lot of uh, us data people are trying to figure out what was the actual reason because we know there were still emergencies we were know those different things was it just because my work is i'm not at work right now i don't have as much stress and and we see this that's what we're trying to tease out if we can find some of those things and that's a challenge that everyone across the nation is trying to explain and look at it and see what it what it's actually telling us okay questions uh, well i mean i think probably some of that is result of car accidents are down right i mean yeah, so I got a check back from my insurance company because they had less claims the last few months. So, I mean, is that part of it as well? Yeah, so the best data number, data crunchers on the planet are insurance people. And, and, and so we, we saw that and, and, and all, along those parts there. When we went in and looked at it, and, and I, I yielded Craig just because we discussed it a little bit when we looked at our numbers, what did we see? We did see the corresponding drop. Well, if you look at our responses for, for uh, car accidents, it was a drop of about one to two a day. So statistically, you'd say, well, that was a 30% change. Well, that's what it was, but it was only a change of one to two. But the insurance industry saw it as a whole. There was this massive period there. And, and so they responded with what they thought was appropriate. So we did see that corresponding drop. And again, it, it came back. And we've um, actually, I think everybody forgot how to drive over those couple of weeks there because we, we've seen a little bit of an uptick on the higher side with it. Now, I, I suppose as we get back to normal, we'll see normal levels on numbers of everything. It's, you know, we have our risk assessment of everything we do, and, and uh, it will. It will level out again. Yeah, it, and it's always that, that new normal. I, I, I refer to this. We've kind of experienced our death, and as we address to what this new normal, and, and there's, still, there's still a ton of challenges. I guess my final comment is the power of team, which includes everybody in this room, the community that has responded well, and just doing some good things there. Uh, we got a lot of good things going on here in Shawnee County and the city of Topeka and stuff. We've got to celebrate those victories as much as possible because, as, as Dr. Norman alluded, we don't know when that end of the road is and when we're 100% back to normal. I've read the statistics. I'm looking at everything that I see it from along those lines there. But that's my final comment is that just that power team is just so essential. We have a good team. Um, I think we're addressing uh, some good, hard challenges, and, and you guys are responding as well because you guys also are making those challenging decisions as well. So I just want to commend everybody in this room and you guys as, as well of, of making those hard decisions. Thank you for your support. Thank you for uh, getting the health department and, and the other agencies responding, emergency management, all of them there of, of having what we need to take care of this community because that's the only way that we're going to get this together. And, and that's not, it's not a cheesy statement. I believe that. I'm, I'm a team player day one type person and saying what do we got to do to address this well this is how we do that and as we continue to do it not only on the streets taking care of those patients and in the hospitals but just us collectively coming together so i commend you guys for your support and appreciation of that one but yeah the, the power team is how we're going to continue to do this and answering these questions such as the mental health and things as well okay. thank you thank for you. your emergency medical service and uh, thank you very much Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Um, next, I'm going to ask Brenda Mills, who is the Director of Family Service and Guidance Center, to come up 
and she's got a short presentation and can answer some questions for you also. Brenda? And this clicker works really well, so. <laughs> Good morning, stuff. <laughs> um, okay, uh, we got that rolling. Um, well, you you all know me, but for the rest of the folks here, I'm fam with Family Service and Guidance Center. I'm Brenda Mills, and um, we are the public mental health system for children in Shawnee County. And we work along with Vallejo Behavioral Health to make sure that our citizens are served with their mental health needs. Um, as other businesses in town, um, we uh, middle March shut down our operations on site with the exception of crisis services, sent uh, our staff home to work by telemed. Uh, there were about 77 staff for which we had no work to do, and so they were just uh, off work for the, this period of time. I wanted to give you guys just some uh, graphical pr presentations of kind of what happened during, during this time so you can kind of see the ebbs and flows of what happens. Um, this is just a graph of our admissions from January 26th of 2020 through just this week. And you can see the, the dip in um, new admissions uh, coming into the agency. We're still not back to pre-COVID levels. And um, while telemed is a great resource for folks, um, not having access, not having our children in schools where many of the referrals come from, um, really was an indicator of how our admissions dropped off significantly. Um, interestingly, and you can't really tell it on this graph, but the blue line at the top, it does trend slightly down, but client attendance at our appointments did improve during this time. So uh, people weren't challenged with transportation issues. They were at home. What else are they going to do? You know, they, <laughs> they're, they can either have school um, online or they can meet with their therapist or their favorite case manager online. So uh, attendance imp was improved during this time uh, slightly, but the appointment time, the length of time was much shorter. So what maybe previously would have been an hour session um, was maybe 30 minutes or if it's, you know, it's very hard to keep kids engaged for a long uh, phone or, their, or a televideo session. This was the most important graph I wanted for you guys to see. You can see what happened with our crisis services when, when COVID hit. Uh, the, the big spikes here are not uh, for suicidal crises. These would be for uh, blow-ups at the home, parent needing help, kid um, not being able to manage the workload, just a variety of different things where they maybe would have had uh, phone calls to our crisis facility. Um, we did have a few, um, an increase in our overnight admissions to our crisis facility, but um, we did not see, um, as was indicated previously, an increase in uh, completed suicides during this time at all. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of what has happened to our overall billable hours. Big drop, leveled off during a time period, starting to creep back up. That little tail on the end that uh, try to ignore that little last segment because that doesn't include all of the services that were provided last week. And same sort of uh, situation with our revenue. So for January through May, our revenues are down 1.4 million. That's about a 10% hit to us. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Plan was how we were able to keep those 77 employees employed. We've kept all of our staff employed through all of this. Um, we are hoping to have some additional Medicaid relief to help with the gap that's occurred. Um, you can see on here I've listed that our fee revenue was, was down at about 32% in March, 44% in April and May, and June is improving. It is about a 20, about 20% drop right now. Um, so I'm just letting you guys know the kinds of challenges that um, present for us. It's just that we need for our parents to know that it's safe to come back to services. We have started seeing folks back in the office. Our community-based staff are back out in the community. And uh, so we're, we're going the extra mile to make sure people know that just like any other healthcare setting, it's safe to come in, even though we might uh, ask you to wait outside for a period of time where we're checking your temperature and those sorts of things. The facility itself is very safe. Um, I, I don't know if I've got this in here, but I, I did want to comment when you guys were talking about kids in schools and masks. You know, we serve children who have some serious emotional issues. And in our psychosocial programs that we started a couple of weeks ago, 
they're wearing masks, and I've been shocked that they are complying and they're wearing their masks. And I thought children who had maybe sensory issues or ADHD would be fiddling, and they're probably fiddling with some, but they, they are complying, which is very surprising to me. Um, in here, we're talking about uh, challenges for accessing services, which I mentioned earlier, admissions, um, without kids being in schools or in other settings that are their, just their normal um, activities where uh, maybe certain behavioral health and mental health issues might be cropping up. Um, those referrals are not coming in the way that, where they didn't come in the way that we are used to. And, and our, our concern is what is going to happen with the school year. That's going to really impact us for sure. Uh, technology, uh, you know, for our clients, um, we had a lot of issues with technology. We have many folks, and as you've heard this from uh, 501 and everybody else in town, a lot of folks don't have access to broadband um, uh, internet, and they're, they're, Med Medicaid does provide some um, smartphones for families, but it's a smartphone, so the parent might have it at work and then the rest of the members in the family who maybe need to use it for services like ours, um, but those just kind of just didn't end up happening. Um, also, with um, everybody having to use televideo during this time, that we were having to compete with the schools for time to see the kids. So they're on, on uh, their you know, tablets or whatever they have from the school, and that was a challenge and, and did help, uh, or did uh, cause a bit of a decrease in some of our services because they were tied um, their, their technology was tied up at home. Um, and just so you guys know that uh, we're, we're going the extra mile to make sure that any of our group settings and our crisis facility, those kids are set up in certain cohorts. We call them pods, or facilities even set up in pods, so that we can uh, make sure that the same group of kids are only interacting with their peers and we don't have a lot of cross uh, people crossing through different programs just in case somebody is positive that we can kind of isolate it and that's caused us to have a, have to reduce the, our capacity for the summer um, also things like when other facilities are closed where we need to go take kids in, in public settings those create a, 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 an issue for us to be able to provide services and of course needing to maintain PPE for our crisis facility we really need child size masks um, our own workforce issues, as everybody else, uh, you know, dealing with their own health issues, childcare issues, and those sorts of things. But it's been a strain on the workforce, but we've been able to keep most everybody. We had a few people that opted to retire during this time. And we've been lucky that we haven't had anybody test positive. Um, uh, when that happens, which I'm sure it will, and we're going to have to have shut down certain programs when that happens, and um, as anybody else would. So that's just a little snapshot of what's been going on. I'm sure you may have some specific questions, but shoot away. So if I was to extrapolate the information you gave, is the more time we spent together as a family, the higher the crisis went within the home? Was that because of the home or because we didn't have the counselors at school that would have been providing those services and those outlets? Yeah, I, I think that that's probably part of it. They didn't have counselors in the school. We couldn't, the children, um, we were not able to provide community-based services. So it was just left to being at home. And I will say that one thing that was really kind of cool by having televideo services is our providers were able to see the home situation when they were working with kids. It was also a bit of a complication because grandma or mom or dad or somebody else might be in the room. But uh, so we, we, we gained some things through using tele, telemed where we were able to see kids in a different environment. Um, but we were not also able to provide services like we normally did. And um, so I, I, that's, what, that's what we attribute to the increase in the need for crisis services. Teen suicide was a huge issue, <coughs> is a huge issue, um, both on the national scale as well as locally. Mm -hmm. um, where do we stand so far this year in addressing teen suicide with, I mean, the impact of the COVID? Is that, are we seeing that that trend staying the same, going down, up? Well, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a clinician, and I think that it's going to be really interesting to look back at this time to see if nationally, if we saw a decrease. I have this theory that when kids were not in school, less bullying was going on so they still have access to social media but it's not as pervasive and mean and you can't where you can't get away from it and because we you know, we're seeing the data that there was fewer suicides completed here locally um, our crisis facility had kids in there but it wasn't for suicidal ideation so that's just my personal 
theory is that perhaps without the stressors that come in the school system, um, maybe some kids felt safer or, or didn't, some of those things didn't manifest themselves. So we continue with our suicide prevention initiatives and, and, and all, so just like we have in the past. And, and we have, like, you know, we had families and kids call us, so that's good. That's what we need to do. It'll be interesting to look back, you know, 10 years I know. from now. It won't. It will be. We'll study it for years. <coughs> Uh, do you anticipate your business model changing in any way because of the telemedicine? Uh, I mean, are there other lessons learned that oh, sure. certain types of people work better in that environment? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, provided that the payers continue to pay for services like they have been, which I, I get the indication that they are, um, uh, certain kids are do far better with that mode of treatment and, and uh, mode of, of service delivery, and we continue to provide it for folks. Um, Transportation can be an issue for many of our clients, so telemed is great. Teen boys don't really want to talk to some female therapist in an office, but they're certainly fine talking on the phone or telemed. Um, our kids who are in our anxiety treatment program feel more comfortable, and maybe that's kind of contrary to the reason that we have them in the treatment program. They need to be interacting with people, but there have been certain situations where it's been a, a, a really great lesson learned and something we want to be able to continue to do for sure yeah and I, w I would say that during all of this our psychiatry department that sees uh, takes care of the medication management they saw no drop in business at all in fact it increased just a little bit people complied they were available for appointments and uh, it was it, it, it's a they will probably continue to provide services by telemed for quite some time forever <laughs> yeah uh, do, do you feel like there's people that just don't want to come in because they they fear the virus that they they just they I don't know I don't know I don't know it, it may be we've we've you know, we have Washburn um, film and a PR group put together a video for us to, on Facebook showing how the pl place is being kept clean and yeah. You know, I think I think it's probably just like the rest of the population. Some people are just not comfortable going out. Uh, everybody is required to wear a mask when they come to our agency, and um, and so those folks who are too uncomfortable, we do continue to provide telemed for them. I, I don't know that it's the vast majority of folks that are not coming in in person. Um, and if somebody calls us and says that we've got a transportation issue, we can just turn right around and say, well, we can do this by telemed now. You don't have to come in here. So. Our attendance rate is, I think, going to continue to be better. That's good to hear. Yeah. Any so, other yeah. questions? Brenda, thank you thank very you much. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you, Brenda, so much for being here today and speaking with us. So now we have Bill Persinger, who is the CEO of uh, Vallejo Behavioral Healthcare. He's going to talk about his agency and what they are seeing. Mr. Mays, what is the name of your auto insurance company, if I may? <laughs> They're sending you money All back. All state. All state. Yeah. Oops, I goofed. <laughs> uh, before I get started, oh, let me take this off. Just got used to it. This, I don't have the planning skills to actually match, you know, colors. It just was the only iron shirt in my closet and the only mask on my desk at the time. So it's quite, I refuse to believe quite that. an accident, I guarantee you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a stunning ensemble. Also. It is. I uh, yeah. got, got, got to maintain fashion statement. So I have to tell you that, and knock on wood, uh, we have not had an active um, diagnosed case at the Mental Health Center yet. Um, and I don't even want to say that because I'll go back to the office and there'll be an email. But I, I want to say that I believe it's uh, not only thanks to the extreme abundance of precaution that we take. We take temperatures every day, you know, all that. We get a badge that we're cleared. But uh, we've been on the phone uh, with both doctors uh, Pizzino uh, and Norman, and they've given us very specific advice about which programs to open, which to close, that latter being a very painful decision. and. One of the numbers I cannot tell you about is how many people didn't come and get help because we had to close our, excuse me, um, our detox program in particular uh, for better than <clears throat> uh, eight weeks. So I heard the calls coming in, people that, no, I'm sorry, we're full or various one thing or another. It was very difficult. We, uh, we limited our, um, our crisis intervention center, the 72-hour program that we have from something like uh, 26 beds down to nine or 10. 
and uh, some other changes that really, you know, bottomed out our numbers. And so um, I want to share some of that data with you uh, today. Uh, PowerPoints always fail me, uh, so I brought paper per usual and laid that on your desk here a little, little, little while back. Um, but I have to tell you that Director Oaks, uh, uh, Craig Barnes, and uh, others have just been super helpful to the Mental Health Center. I, early on, and in fact, over time, would send Linda a text at all hours of the day and say, hey, what do you think about this or that? And she was always very helpful, and, and uh, we do uh, could not have done this uh, by ourselves. And so our, I think our success so far in, in remaining negative, a negative environment um, for, the, for the disease is attributed to our public health officials and, of course, our, our staff who work uh, every, every day, like Sally, who is one of our secretaries, normally sits behind a window. Uh, I don't know if Sally's age, but she's about my age-ish, and she's out there every day in one of our waiting rooms greeting people face-to-face -face with a thermometer, uh, asking questions, you know, being two or three feet from them for a few seconds like she has to be, but out there cleaning that waiting room every day. But she is right there with people face-to-face -face every day, and uh, what, what a brave soul. So we've kept most of our services going in one way uh, or another. Uh, so like with the detox, for example, and the inpatient alcohol drug program, the reintegration alcohol, we just shut that down, just flat shut it down. And um, that, was, uh, that was difficult on us uh, personally and financially, and uh, also we think on the recovery and uh, process that people experienced. But we did keep most services going, made some drastic changes to protect staff and that kind of thing. Things are headed back to normal, I'd say you know, we're at a decent pace, uh, pace back to normal. We have discovered that a few people can successfully work from home. They, they probably will continue. Maybe some, you know, uh, business and support staff. Uh, just like the Guidance Center, we did have a, a really good experience, uh, for the most part, with televideo and telephone therapy. Uh, thank uh, Dr. Norman out in the hallway uh, for his, uh, his, his cabinet approving the use of telephones uh, and be able to build Medicaid uh, for that. Uh, Medicaid is, uh, you know, roughly 90% of our fee revenue, something like more than, it's right at half our, of all of our revenue. And so any little wiggle really disrupts practice, uh, both for uh, the Guidance Center and, and for Vallejo. And had it not been for that, uh, we, we would have really been sunk. Now, electronic-based therapies are not going to be a long-term a long replacement for face-to-face -face work in somebody's home or on the street or or in an office or you know at, at the jail uh, for example uh, which is the other service that we had to pull out of under under a, 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 a director Cole's uh, guidance which it was absolutely the right decision to limit limit people coming in out of your, out of your jail but it, it we did find that the electronic based therapies were very helpful in prescribing attendance remained high uh, we give several hundred um, antipsychotic injectable shots uh, every month people had to come in for that um, but uh, it's been a, a, an eye-opener for t uh, t televideo practice in, in prescribing medications. We'll probably continue to do that in, in a very uh, good effort. That it was okay for individual counseling. I don't think it's going to be our mode of practice going forward, um, but it's very difficult to do the home-based case management, that kind of you know, caseworker, that, that on-the-street level form of care. So we are looking at getting back more and more to face-to-face -face services. Nearly all of our case managers, we have 35 or 40 or so are back out on the street uh, working with people, going into homes. We, we visit in lawn chairs where we can outside with folks, but uh, that face-to-face that -face practice is going to be kind of our, kind of where we go and go, go back to. But uh, that we, we do appreciate the opportunity to build by telephone, which is something heretofore unheard of for Medicaid or, or other third-party uh, payers. The revenue, uh, on the other hand, has dropped significantly. And while we could connect with somebody by phone or by televideo, it hasn't had the financial, uh, you know, income, and that has dropped quite a bit. We did provide, have provided to you our uh, May 31 uh, uh, income statement, and I believe that our uh, 2019 uh, annual audit has been filed with uh, Betty's office, and so that's available for uh, your review. Um, I'll comment on that just a little bit. Um, so uh, we quit taking new admissions to our, and I use the word group homes kind of just generically. A lot of people know what that is. We call it residential care or transitional living facilities. We, we didn't discharge anybody, didn't send anybody away, but we didn't admit new people, which of course affects revenue and recovery and all those things. Uh, we did reduce the beds at the residence at 400 Southwest Oakley. Um, a lot of work from home. Uh, so the big impact on us was crisis calls, kind of depends on how you look at the data, but they, they were down uh, somewhat uh, overall, uh, not uh, to a large degree, but but most of our crisis services come 
from the residents at, at 400 Southwest Oakley. And because we cut the number of beds available, you do see a decrease there. Uh, and we, uh, it, that is starting to creep back up uh, from seven, eight, nine people to 12, 13, 14 people a day. So we expect those numbers to get back to normal uh, fairly soon and, and are working hard on that. Uh, what, has, what, what has impacted us is demand from the uninsured. Uh, people who have no kind of health insurance at all and uh, that those numbers have gone up pretty dramatically and some of that's on the bottom half of the first page uh, demand overall was up by 29 percent the first five months of this year uh, compared to all of 2019 um, and even more dramatically up when you go back to 2015 which happened to be just kind of an average year for for this one particularly low year um, the uh, medication services demand, uh, which is probably the most expensive thing that we do from the uninsured, has, has gone up. Uh, primary care uh, has uh, the demand from, uh, from people who are uninsured has increased by 32% in that particular clinic and 12% um, uh, demand by uh, the uninsured in for, uh, for counseling. We did receive a paycheck uh, protection uh, loan of $2.7 million. Uh, Fidelity Bank uh, here in town did a stellar job of getting us on board and getting us in early. Uh, those dollars are sustaining us and uh, because we did have some folks who, uh, who, who, whose jobs we were able to uh, protect because of that, Qu quite a few of them as a matter of fact. And then I do mention the audit's been filed. On the income statement, uh, real quickly, it's a little fluky. Uh, we took, uh, back in 2002, the Menninger Foundation left us a couple of residential care facilities and um, so we uh, merged uh, one of those facilities with the main mental health corporation. It did bring a little bit of cash over and some value and some property. You'll see that in, on the income statement on line number 11 under the revenue. And if you'll, if you'll go over four columns, you'll see a figure of, uh, uh, exactly out of my reading distance here, uh, $489,000 and change. And so that had a one-time temporary salutary effect on uh, revenues. Um, if you take that number out, uh, our losses look more like $700,000, $600,000 a year to date. It's a little bit better than it was at the end of April. It was minus $800,000, uh, quite a chunk of change uh, when it cost $60,000 a day to run the mental health center. I'm telling people we're down. We're at the end of April down about 10 operational days, revenue being behind expenses. And uh, that's a little bit better now. It's only temporary. I do hope that things uh, will improve. Uh, the budget was improving quite a bit. We had uh, almost at a break-even point at the end of March. And then, like everybody else, things just went, you know, uh, went, went, uh, went, went bad, uh, you know, for, for, uh, in, in, at all levels. Uh, so we are trying to watch personnel expenses. We're behind budget on uh, both salaries uh, and benefits and, and uh, quite a bit more of ex expenses in, uh, you know, for office and client supplies, as you might imagine, even though we've had something like 20,000 masks donated. Uh, we have had to buy, you know, a lot of materials and, and, and get laptops for people so they could work at home. A lot of, a lot of different kind of expenses we've been used to experiencing. But uh, with that uh, short um, presentation, I'll, I'll st stand for questions as long as you need me. Um, Bill, thank you for everything that you do in the community. And um, at the last Board of Health meeting, I had asked Linda to kind of put this together because I think that we need to have a public comment and public discussion on where we stand as um, crisis care and mental health care. Um, moving forward, where do you see Vallejo going with the uh, detox programs, the, those, those key things that we had maybe kind of put a hold on um, when we were at the safer at home levels? <clears throat> Well, uh, we reopened the, if, if I'm hearing you right, Commissioner, we, we reopened the, uh, the detox and the other alcohol and drug programs, was it two weeks ago? And I've already seen, you know, uh, people just came in very, very quickly. We're opening those beds up kind of one room at a time. And we basically went from two to a room to one to a room is what we did just to preserve health mm -hmm. and safety. But uh, and that was a whole lot better than zero to a room. So right. uh, we have ramped up, continue to ramp that up. The, the, the fact that some of the numbers are, it appear to be resurging bothers me a little bit and so we're being pretty careful but um, we we're looking forward to having those services uh, fully uh, back online and you'll know, be able to get people into our transitional living facilities again it's the one of the main ways when somebody comes out of a state hospital that they have a, a place to live that's safe and and secure and offers them a chance for recovery and so you know having to limit that has been difficult for us as well and so um, 
Now, the state hospital currently has a pretty long waiting list, and it's, it's what I'm hearing to get in. Um, and if you're not able to get into the state hospital, I mean, um, are we just providing some intermediate care yet? Pal yeah, palliative in some ways. We are, um, and we, you know, we continue to deliver medicine, uh, psychiatric medicine to people's houses to try to, you know, keep them uh, all in balance. Uh, we've been pretty selective about who we take at the crisis residential facility to make sure that, you know, we're taking the worst first, if you'll let me speak colloquially. Uh, and, um, you know, to, to kind of triage our cases. Uh, we have uh, worked pretty closely with the state hospital on, on, and the local court system has been outstanding to work with and making sure that anybody we look to send down there uh, really needs to be there. And if not, we're doing whatever we can to provide crisis care, crisis case management, uh, have, have found some temporary living facilities uh, for people, and then we can send help in there to where they're living. I've continued that during the COVID. Um, and I, I, you know, it's a, it's a, a lot of times a matter of, of doing a good medical screening before we send uh, folks down to the state hospital, and we've tried to do that. The local health systems have been very cooperative in that area and, and very helpful to us. Uh, but the state hospital does remain somewhat less of an asset than it used to be. They've, they've also reduced their capacity uh, I, from the last I heard from, you know, down to single rooms where they had more, more spacing, and that has backed things up uh, somewhat. We have pretty good ongoing dialogue with those folks, and, and uh, we're just pretty careful about who, who we send down there and then creating alternative systems here for those folks uh, while they wait to get in, including staying at the residence. Outside of the virus itself and sanitation and distancing issues, is the uninsured ratio one of the major impacts to your ability to provide those services? It's tough on us, uh, yeah, very, very much. I appreciate you asking that. It's one of the reasons I put that statistic out there. If there's been an increase in, in any area, it's been, you know, from the, uh, from, from the uninsured, and uh, we assume that's people uh, losing jobs and coverage and, and, and that kind of thing. We uh, normally have something like a $2 million a year uh, financial um, uh, impact from the uninsured, a charitable care impact, if you will. I think this year that was down around one seven or one eight. I don't, I don't quite remember, but we expect that to surge uh, a little bit. And with you know grants having been frozen uh, for many years and demand going up from people who could pay, you know, less than you know ten percent of uh, you know what it might ordinarily cost them. It's, it's been a, a pretty good, pretty good financial impact on us. So. But yeah, the demand from the uninsured is, is, is coming back up. Thank you. Bill, I, obviously the, the, with the virus and, and having 9 10% unemployment, and, and it's caused these people mm -hmm. not be insured anymore. And, and here's some wild numbers where case management service up 54%, medicated, medication services up 40%, primary care 32%. Uh, counseling service 12 percent are we seeing it coming down any at all as people kind of go back to work or we still have too many so. people unemployed to, to see you know, much movement there yeah thank you for that question it's a good question going into it you know uninsured I uh, around you know a little bit more than a third of our uh, clientele and the rest are uh, paid by Medicaid eight nine or ten percent have some commercial uh, in, insurance uh, payer and um, you know I really the only thing that we can do internally we have to be pretty careful about it because we can't turn people away and we have not uh, other than the limits we had to put on some of our programs um, is to ration out or ra excuse me ration out some certain services so if a person's uninsured if they need to come in three or four times a month maybe they can only come in once a month or you know some of the specialty services we provide may have to limit that but you know four or five years ago when I first got here we, we had to limit we had to uh, ration some forms of uh, services for the uninsured. It it hurt us uh, pretty bad uh, here, <laughs> uh, but it was all we could do, you know. And and uh, we didn't turn anybody away, but we did we did limit some of the volume and the and the density and the and the length of services offered. That would be about the only thing we can do. And and if things uh, persist and don't get better, some bright lights that are developing out there for us now don't really you know shine too long on us. Because some good things are happening. It might be a slight increase in Medicaid rate. It can be a very slight increase in state funding. You know, some, there may be a couple of good things happening that, that might help us get through this. But, uh, you know, we don't want to go back to where we had to limit, put stronger limits on, on, the, on the scope and the volume of care to the uninsured. That, that's about our only tool, Commissioner. Do you test new patients as they come in or for, for COVID? 
Uh, no, we take temperatures uh, every day and they fill out a questionnaire and sign a piece of paper. We give everybody a mask who comes in. We had a, a several staff who got together and made about a thousand masks. And like I said, we've had, you know, uh, 20,000 or so donated. We're, we're sitting okay now for masks, but, uh, you know, we want to project ahead and make sure we have enough. If they come in with uh, symptoms, do you? Turn send them around. Back we out. do. We would have to turn them away, and I don't know yeah. what that rate is, uh, yeah. Commissioner. I'm I'm just not sure. I should have been prepared to answer that oh, question. Sorry. And uh, I know we have 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 had several staff who voluntarily stayed at home. I took a trip, and then I heard about this. I'm gonna stay at home for 14 days. I don't know who we're turning away from the door. Um, I can tell you that we just wouldn't turn them away with no kind of support. There'd be a phone number to call. A caseworker would call them, a prescriber would call them, a therapist, somebody tried to establish a, a phone connection with those individuals. But uh, having access to televideo and telephones is, has allowed us to keep that connection, although I don't think it's a good form of practice for us going forth um, overall. It'll help in a couple, three areas. I think we need to maintain that, but we want to get back to a more you know, personal kind of service. Okay. Anything else? On the, I know the, uh, the <clears throat> the detox program is a large part of what you guys do and is, to shut yes. that down is, is is rough and during that time if if somebody were to come in or call and say like I absolutely need to do this I mean um, what was the protocol are there still outpatient services that there, you guys were trying yes. to offer treatment um, referring to other agencies or I mean all the above uh, crisis plans uh, we could go ahead and do outpatient counseling. Uh, I, my office is on the same floor where the outpatient alcohol and drug therapists have their offices, and I've, you know, walked by, and many of them are on, um, you know, closed, doors closed. They're in a telephone or a televideo session. There'd be prescribing available. We did make some referrals uh, to other, other places that, uh, you know, maybe they only downsized. They didn't close, but uh, we took an abundance of precaution to actually close that program, and I'm I'm sorry that we did, but I'm glad that we did. I think it was the right thing to do. It was hard, but yeah, we made referrals uh, elsewhere and and uh, crisis plans, counseling, medication, that that kind of thing. Um, and, and on that, um, you mentioned you're doing kind of a worst first approach right now. Is that is there like a waiting list to? To get into those 10 beds that you've got now, or where you say you're doing like some kind of a pre-screen, where you say like these people are absolutely in desperate need and and these ones maybe not so much or i know we've got people waiting to get into the detox and the inpatient alcohol and drug abuse program i do not know if there's a formal waiting list to get into the crisis center uh the uh you know you call it a, a mental illness crisis center for lack of the residential 72-hour uh, program we have made some alternative arrangements for people that when, when our beds were full um, we've we've uh, been able to find uh, you know a safe place for them to live with family, uh, have have motel rooms, or uh, the rescue mission has been uh, helpful. Um, you just found you know alternative housing for those folks through some rental subsidies, and then to be able to stay in touch with those folks e either in person or by uh, by telephone. But I don't know of a waiting list per se, Commissioner, to get into the to the 72-hour mental illness crisis program. Um, Thank you. And then we've, we've also had that, your question makes me think, we've also had that fear factor. We know for sure that, that uh, there have been a, uh, quite a few uh, individuals who just didn't want to come at all and, and get help. And that's, that's the part that worries me. If you're sitting there alone and needing help and you didn't reach out, I have, have no way to measure that. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that quite a few people have not been comfortable just getting out and accessing any kind of health care. You know, other health care agencies also reported a drop off in people. And so the message is how to, how to help folks understand that the building is clean, we're safe, we're taking precautions. Uh, I know that we've uh, helped people with transportation, with uh, vouchers. Um, the other thing we quit doing is, you know, sometimes if you have a case manager who comes to your house, part of your recovery might be learning how to budget and shop and do this and do that. You hop in the car and, you know, you help somebody deal with their symptoms where they're out in public. You go to the store, you get food, you help people plan ahead. That's all, you know, part of, you know, being emotionally well balanced. And, we just we shut that down for a long time too and so our case managers had fewer tools available to them and we're starting to open that back up again as well and um our, our we're using we have some vans we've been using those to haul like one or two people maybe here or there to do a specific uh, recovery oriented task but um slowly starting to re-engage those things but overcoming that fear factor is tough but even including you know some staff are like well i just don't know you know if it's time for me to come back to work and so we've granted some health exceptions and some other things like that so. 
Okay, well, any other questions? Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, folks. Thank you, and Take care. thanks for all the service you do to this community. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bill, very much. So that, those are our speakers for today and our information that we have to present to you. Um, I'd be happy also to stand for any further questions or follow-up questions. Any questions? I, you know, one of the things I heard today quite a bit was the fear factor. And uh, a lot of people are still just afraid to, to come out. And, I, you know, I, I know at first we had these, these kind of apocalyptic narratives, you know, and, and it scared a lot of people. But... Uh, I, I think how we report things makes a difference, and uh, and uh, it can have a calming effect, or it can it can it can uh, cause them to go back into a shell or fear going out. And and there are some people that should stay in. There, mm -hmm. the people that are vulnerable; they need to protect themselves. But uh, I, I hope in the future we we do what we can to try to try to calm the fear, so people can come back out. Our economy certainly needs it. And uh, it, it's hurting us, and uh, I'm seeing it in all aspects of our health community. So, yes. I just want to thank you for putting this together. This was a yeah. very, very informative. It's great to hear from um, people in, in their respective fields about things that, um, I mean, obviously, like we work with Vallejo, we work with Family Services Guidance Center, but um, this, this topic is something we've not really addressed outside of. You know, I serve on the Economic Recovery Task Force, and so I hear from Bill and Brenda there. But um, this, this is very informative, and I thank you guys for everybody that, that came and spoke today. I appreciate it. Sure. Okay. But I think it also answers. We hear anecdotal, um, you know, things about rises in domestic violence, rises in suicide. Um, we've been able to answer that, and we see that we have not had the rise in the suicide, but we have had rises in domestic calls, but it being able to put real data, real facts, instead of just relying on I heard. Right. Um, yes. I would rather he have real facts than I heard. So. That's a good point. All right. Well, that uh, I think that concludes our Shawnee County Board of Health meeting for today. So thank you for attending. Thank you, Commissioners. All right.